This got released in cinemas. Holy shit! The most recent soulless video game adaptation nobody asked for stuck his ratchet head out of the dirt that is the corporate Hollywood movie machine and kinda just gave the finger to everyone stupid enough to buy a ticket for this shit. And let me tell you, I'm not using the word shit lightly. This dung heap really reeks. Oh, we're gonna make a true adaptation of the Resident Evil games. We're gonna stick more to the plot of the games this time. God, Paul Anderson must feel really great about himself right now. I just can't understand how anyone could greenlight this. And don't get me wrong, I'm not frothing at my mouth right now. At the time I'm recording this, I've watched the movie multiple times to write my script. So right now I'm of course not filled with rage. But when I watched the movie the first time, I was pissed. Which is the reason I even started this critique. So what is wrong with this movie? No, no, let me ask this in another way. What is not wrong with this movie? Well, there are some neat nudges towards the video games, both classic and modern. There's the truck driver munching on his burger. There's the Raccoon City Police Department and the parking lot that looks like the one in the remake. We get to see the keys for the police station that are most likely the ones you can buy on Amazon. There's an advertisement for the first aid spray. There's the itchy tasty reference to one of the most important diary entries from the first game that explained how the zombies in this universe work, something the Anderson movies fucked up royally. And then there's the introduction of the first zombie that pretty much recreates the moment you met the first zombie in the first game. It's a great reference for fans of the games and it stands strong on its own with superb acting and fucking awesome zombie makeup. Too bad this isn't the first zombie we get to see in the movie. We get to see a whole lot of them earlier in the movie and they all look terrible and are credited as Chernobyl zombies, which is kinda disrespectful. Yeah, they explain the effects of the T-virus kinda like radiation poisoning and mention Chernobyl, but come on, call them radiation zombies or just zombie 1, 2, 3 like every other movie. And yeah, I guess that leads me into everything that's wrong with this movie. So let's just start with the movie's opening scene set in the Umbrella Orphanage. How do I know this is managed by Umbrella? Well, the movie beats us over the head with it. Will this setup serve any purpose in the overall story? Nope. I mean, aside from one ridiculous contrivance. Here we meet Chris and Claire, who are now orphans with a connection to Umbrella for some reason. Well, pretty much everyone has a connection to Umbrella in this movie, because instead of Raccoon City being a quiet small town in the mountains that Umbrella chose to conduct their nefarious experiments in simply because it was a backwater town, in this movie Raccoon City is more of a company town and pretty much everyone worked for Umbrella. Everyone except the people secretly working for Umbrella in the games. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So Chris and Claire are living in the Umbrella Orphanage and Claire spots a strange creature and it's implied that she has seen this girl multiple times in the past. But Chris warns her not to talk about it lest they get punished by Dr. Birkin. So he is here too. Though we don't learn his name until later. Claire still sneaks away and follows the strange girl, who turns out to be Lisa Trevor, a tragic antagonist from the remake of the first game. So she is here too. Who else is here? Is Wesker sleeping in the bunk right next to Chris? Oh no, it's so much worse. In bed, snuggled in Wesker's big burly arms. <laughs> So Claire talks to Lisa for a bit and then gets caught by Dr. Birkin. She is sent back to bed where she gets jump scared by Lisa Trevor for whatever reason because she doesn't seem to be a murdering psychopath in this version and Claire talked to her just a few minutes ago. Well, that jump scare transported Claire right into Resident Evil 2. She's hitchhiking with the trucker we all know and love from the game and his job, aside from getting infected and being the cause for Leon and Claire to split up, which doesn't even happen in this movie, is also to spout exposition in the most unnatural way possible. Gone to see your brother, he said. He used to live here, he said. He hits a woman standing in the road who turns out to be a zombie. But it seems zombies in this movie aren't really hungry for the flesh of the living because she just pisses off. Meanwhile, the trucker's dog has nothing better to do than jump out of the car and lick the woman's blood off the road. And now we finally know how the zombie dogs came to be. What the fuck? So the dog later bites his owner, fucking bit me, you motherfucker! who crashes his truck into the police station, which results in that hilarious scene.
I'm all for a bit of style and some comedy even in a horror movie. And in a better movie this scene could have worked. But here it's just another tone deaf moment in a movie already devoid of tone. The movie just blunders and fumbles around and thoughtlessly throws in one element from the games after another and manages to pretty much ruin everything. Claire probably got the best deal in this piss take of a movie. Yeah, she gets a bit overly vulgar and doesn't really show her caring side. Get your shit together. Even though Sherry Birkin, the girl she saved in Resident Evil 2, is in this movie, but she's mostly okay. The rest though? Who boy! Let's start with the next character we're introduced to. Let's observe his surroundings, the way he acts, the way he looks, and try to deduce which one of the colorful cast he's supposed to represent. So he's in a messy motel room, there's bottles of beer and bourbon by his bed. When the alarm rings, he jolts upright while his head is still covered by the sheets and he's clearly disoriented. When he sticks his head out from under the sheets, he reveals his dark locks and he welcomes the new day with a fuck. And while the lurings in the background sing about being tired of working every day, he takes the last sip of cold, stale beer. Would you have guessed that this mystery man is none other than young, idealistic, rookie Leon Scott Kennedy about to start his first day on the force? Yeah, me neither. He doesn't look like Leon, so I guess it makes sense that he doesn't act like Leon either, right? He's this washed up dude, a policeman coming to work on his first day hungover, who doesn't take his job seriously, can't shoot for shit, can't handle himself during a crisis, and is just a joke to everyone around him. You're probably wondering what a guy like me is doing as a cop, right? I know. Yeah, me too. Yeah, me too. Why the fuck would they do this to Leon Kennedy? One of, if not the most beloved character from the games. Just throwing him into this shit stain of a movie and ridicule him in every scene he's in. What the fuck are you doing here, Leon? Get a haircut, you goddamn hippie. What's the S stand for, stupid? Yeah, Leon, you're a cocksucker. Fuck you, Leon. You're an asshole. You're a piece of shit. Calm. On. You moron? And I mean, he's not even my favorite character. My favorite character isn't even in this movie, and thank God for it. But did the writer or director or anyone who worked on this really think that mocking one of the most beloved characters from the games was a good idea? Is this a Ryan Johnson move to subvert our expectations by turning an honest and kind-hearted guy into this incompetent idiot? But hey, remember the guy balancing a bottle of ketchup on Leon's head? That's Wesker! Not Captain Wesker as far as I know, just a dude named Wesker who works for stars, which despite the name isn't anything special in the precinct it seems. So he's just another policeman goofing around with all his police friends. He isn't the mastermind who orchestrated the incident. He's just a dirty cop with a mostly good heart who earns a bit on the side by selling evidence of Umbrella's operations to an unknown third party to get out of this small town dead end life. Dead end life. So instead of leading his subordinates into a mansion that's secretly a Umbrella testing facility to let them fight all kinds of monsters and collect data on it, he just follows directions from a pager to find the underground laboratory within the mansion. Yeah, one of the puzzles he has to solve is the iconic Moonlight Sonata puzzle from the first game, but it's not his place to solve puzzles. He should observe. And they ruined even that little reference by having him play the piece and not Jill who is with him in the room and god damn it what have they done to Jill. The only thing she does in that movie is making references towards the games. Be swallowed whole by a snake or eaten alive by a great white shark. And being Wesker's girlfriend or maybe girl pal. She's my bro. But during her introduction with Wesker and who the fuck that other guy is, the first thing she does is drawing a gun in a diner. You know, something you'd expect Barry Burton to do. I have this. But he's nowhere to be seen. Is it that guy? God, I hope not. The master of unlocking waves a gun around in her introduction while Claire is breaking into Chris's house right now. Why didn't she just get a scene where she had to force open a lock? If they wanted her to be in that diner so much, she could have unlocked the toilet for example. Nah, she references the games all the time, but when it comes to stuff she actually did in the games, it's someone else's turn, I guess. But hey, at least she's eating a Jill sandwich. Ha 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 ha.
And then we have Chris. He's in this movie as well. So they now kinda merge the first two games into one with this movie. While the Stars team explores the Spencer Mansion, Leon Claire and the police chief try to escape the zombies inside the police department. Oh right, Chief Irons was working for Umbrella in the games, but here he's just another asshole trying to get out of town. We learn that the outbreak was not due to the Stars team wrecking the lab in the Spencer Mansion and the aftermath of it, but because Umbrella had poisoned the water and turned the inhabitants of Raccoon City over the course of years into this. Oh yeah, Claire, see if you can spot the virus in the water. Fucking hell. And now, for whatever reason, they just packed their stuff and took off. Well, they left one of their most important scientists behind, and it seems they didn't inform him that they're gonna blow up the whole city. Because he's still living a happy life with his wife and daughter, and still conducts his research until the night before it's supposed to happen. Well, he finally gets the call and grabs his family and gets the hell out of here. But not before collecting all his notes and samples. Too bad that Wesker got hired to do the exact same thing. And this only happens so that we can have an epic boss fight. Well, in theory. But I'll get to that in time. There's still a lot of BS we have to cipher through before that. Most of that BS concerns the main attraction of any Resident Evil story. Up until 4, I guess. The zombies. To this movie's credit, it went with the slowly turning zombies who are, in fact, not dead. So it got dead over the Anderson movies. Good work. Have a start. Stars. Everything else is fucking horrible. The zombies look weird and they behave weirdly. A horde forms outside the police station and just stands there, reaching through the gate for a bit, pleading to be let in and generally being weird. It's not an inherently bad way to present a zombie-like creature, it's just not what has been established in the Resident Evil universe. Yeah, I already mentioned that the zombies aren't actually dead and in some cases turn slowly enough for observers to notice the gradual changes in behavior and mental capacity and a few of those would have been fine, but not all of them. For fuck's sake, Anderson's reanimated dead were better depictions of Resident Evil zombies. Even the itchy tasty zombie is a bit out of place here. In the original game you can find a diary from one of the workers at the research facility, who got accidentally infected with the T-virus. He developed a skin condition with an itchy rash that, when scratched, resulted in rotting flesh coming off. An increase in aggression and violence was implied when he describes that he killed a co-worker because his face was ugly. His writing becomes less and less comprehensible and the last words in the diary are itchy, tasty. So why would some random woman write this in blood on some random door out of nowhere? And why do the zombies sound like dinosaurs? Is this another reference because Capcom also made Dino Crisis? The zombies also behave really inconsistent throughout the movie and I get that not everything has to be 100% consistent all the time, but when it gets too obvious, it just ruins my immersion. Sometimes the zombies can be quite effective, if the script allows them to kill one of the characters, but look at that! Chris is holding off two zombies. Okay, why is the third one just standing there? Oh and look at that, a scene later Chris is already free and able to escape. How did he manage that? Don't know and the writers sure as hell didn't care. What was he doing? Or that one? Hey, as long as we don't see it, it doesn't have to make sense, right? So how did they open that gate? Look, the bolt is just gone in the next shot. <laughs> the, the next one is great. This zombie appeared suddenly, a moment after Leon looked directly down the hallway. Either he's that incompetent or the movie just teleported a zombie right next to Claire. Either explanation is dumb as hell. There's also a lack of other monsters in this movie. Yeah, there is this one infected dog that is disposed of pretty quickly and we get to see a zombie crow, even though the crows in the game weren't infected but trained. And there's the atrocious Birkin tyrant at the end. Oh, and there's one liquor that attacks the quiet person and not the one shouting and gets defeated by Lisa Trevor when Leon and Claire escape through the orphanage. And I mean, she was a monster in the first remake, but isn't really one in this version. In her original story, her parents were killed by Umbrella and she had been experimented on until she was able to escape. During the experiments, the scientists tried to calm her down by having one woman impersonating her mother, but Lisa didn't believe the charade and ripped off the woman's face to see if her mother's true face was behind it. 
and this led to her compulsively collecting faces. So yeah, this weird hood thingy she's wearing, these are dead faces. This thing has to smell awful. We can also catch a glimpse of Lisa's hands during the opening of the movie and they look satisfyingly gruesome. When she later kills a licker by jumping around like a circus acrobat and breaks its neck from behind, we get a better look at her arms and legs, which look pretty fine and not that mutated and dirty and damaged. Maybe she's just a woman with a stupid mask and some shackles in this version and not another horrible abomination born from Umbrella's experiments. Well, she leads Claire and Leon towards a secret passage to the Umbrella Lab, where they are gonna meet up with the rest of the remaining cast. Meanwhile, the Stars team tries to fend off hordes of zombies at the mansion. They try to turn Wesker into a bad guy at this point and yeah, he does shoot two people to obtain the G-Virus and fails, but they tried to spin it so that Wesker left his friends to die at the Spencer Mansion, which wasn't his plan in any way. Wesker betrayed us, Chris. We have to follow him because I think it's the only way out of here. Try the front door. He didn't even know that the mansion was full of zombies or that a fucking helicopter would crash through the wall. And right before he abandoned the team, he rescued Jill from another zombie. So I don't know what the movie was going for. And at the end they hint at his freshly developed superpowers, I guess to set him up to be the villain in a sequel that will hopefully never happen after this mess. So the gang meets up in time for William Birkin to infect himself with the G-Virus, so that we get a boss fight with this huge, muscular abomination that looks wimpy as fuck. He's just an old dude wearing a cosplay arm. He strangles Chris for a bit and mocks him for, I don't know, loving his foster father. Yeah, uh, Birkin adopted Chris in this movie, but they share absolutely no screen time aside from this boss fight. Well, Claire comes to the rescue in a, honestly, pretty badass moment, and Birkin seems to come to his senses and urges Claire to finish him off. Which would have been fine, but they needed to have Chris kill him and cuss at him when he seemed to say his farewells to his foster son. My boy, shut the fuck up. I'm not sure what's worse, that someone as unequivocally evil as this guy gets an act of redemption, or that this Chris is so heartless that he doesn't even allow his father his last words. A few hours ago he idolized Birkin and he doesn't know anything about Birkin's research or Umbrella's involvement. He has no reason to hate Birkin and he knows that Birkin wasn't himself during the fight. <sighs> it's over soon. After that, they get on an underground train to escape before the city is destroyed. But Birkin wasn't completely dead. He mutates even more off screen so they don't have to make any effort. And we get to see this CGI atrocity. It's too powerful and it seems that our heroes are done for, but then Leon gets his moment to shine and fucks it up. You ugly fuck! So the monster is dead and the whole city gets destroyed and this. This is the shot the movie should have ended on, because it encapsulates the whole experience perfectly. It's just a silly joke. No one involved could have taken this seriously. I mean, there are some moments that create a bit of atmosphere. When the stars team flies over the raccoon forest, discovers Alpha Team's jeep and finds the mansion as well as their first zombie encounter. This here could be a completely different movie. A better one. Not a great adaptation, because there are still many mistakes in here, but at least a good RE inspired horror movie. Not that it lasts for long. Soon enough all the bullshit catches up and we get zombies that get into position for a pose or approach their prey just to fuck off and then reappear moments later from a different direction. The people in charge showed a general misunderstanding of the story, the characters, the monsters or the lore. This was not only a bad, but also a disrespectful adaptation. Now I'm talking from the perspective of a Resident Evil fan and I guess not everything I mentioned is as important to others as it is to myself. But even if we ignore all the departures from the source material, it's still a bad movie. Zombies are either teleporting or are just completely useless depending on what the script needs at the moment. Action scenes are hilariously badly acted and edited when you're allowed to even see them. Things just explode for no reason. The movie constantly beats you over the head that it's set in the 90s. 
Maybe they hoped this would redeem the movie at least a little bit. Well, it didn't. This movie is just another horrible video game adaptation in a long line of bad video game movies. Studios just need to accept that they are not capable of producing a good video game adaptation, at least not with the approach they've used up until now. Maybe get the people on board who actually worked on the game and not just buy the rights to an IP and shit out some garbage. Or maybe just leave it alone completely. No movie will capture the magic of something like classic Resident Evil, or Tomb Raider, or Hitman. Just keep your greedy fingers off video games. And if you want to watch an actual great zombie movie, try Night of the Living Dead. Now here's a classic. And with that, I'm off. That's it from Rady. Have a great day and I'm gonna try to forget this awful shit.